Left off with Jonathan Edwards last time. Many of you were here two weeks ago, just prior to Easter, and we were talking about how Edwards in many ways shared the view of the other Puritans. He's the greatest, the last, the genius of Puritanism, universally regarded as the most brilliant Puritan thinker, divine as they would call them, and really the last of them in the mid-1700s here in America. Jonathan Edwards gives us the most powerful and thorough expression of what's called Puritan eschatology. This is not uniquely his view. However, he is the one that brings it to its culminating expression. You can find it in English Puritanism a hundred years earlier. And you certainly find it almost universally among the American Puritans. But Edwards is the one who gives it its most robust treatment. I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that John Calvin wrote a commentary on virtually all the Bible. There was only two or three books that didn't make the list, one of which was Revelation. John Calvin, sadly, never wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation. When asked about it, he simply observed the ground was too holy to tread upon. And people have speculated what exactly he meant by that. We can piece together what was likely his view and probably the most likely theory is that he shared the view of Augustine that Revelation is basically describing first century events. But I can't say that with a high degree of confidence because he said so little about Revelation himself. But that is probably the at least accepted view of what he said. The interesting thing about Edwards is he didn't write a commentary on any book of the Bible except Revelation. So he kind of made up the difference here, and it's cons considered one of his greatest works. Perry Miller, whose name you may recognize, he was the great professor of English literature at Harvard University in the mid-20th century, and is probably the flowering genius who rediscovered the Puritans. The Puritans had fallen on hard times in the public reputation. People thought of them as kind of these sour, dark people that always wore dark clothes, and they really confused them a lot with, with others, but this was not the Puritans at all. And Perry Miller really recovered a much more accurate memory of them. He was not a Christian to my knowledge. He simply was fascinated with their genius. He was especially interested in Jonathan Edwards, whom he called the greatest artist of the apocalypse. Edwards worked out what's commonly called a post-millennial eschatology, and it's at this point that the Puritans are offering something that is distinct when compared with the other views that we've looked at so far. I'll talk about post-millennialism and what it means as we go along here, but I want to give you the title because it's one of these typical Puritan titles. It's about half the length of the book itself, you know. The uh, Puritan title here from Edwards that uh, was the working out of his view of Revelation was called, quote, an humble attempt to promote explicit agreement and visible union of God's people in extraordinary prayer for the revival of religion and the advancement of Christ's kingdom on earth. Catchy, isn't it? It's usually just referred to as the humble attempt. And it was a masterful piece of work. And it is a treatment of Revelation, but in it, he works out this eschatological scheme that's commonly called postmillennialism. The basic guts of the matter simply reduces to this, that there will come a time, according to Edwards, of sweeping success for the church and for the gospel in the world. I'm hesitant to use this term, but it will sort of convey the idea, I think, immediately to you, a kind of, quote, golden age of the church and the gospel. The word golden age kind of has baggage, so I'm not real keen on that, but I'm going to use it just to give you the idea. Something still future, toward which we are moving, but we haven't gotten there yet. That was Edward's view. That was the general Puritan view, you see, going clear back to England, certainly in the colonies. Edward said, quote, though there never will in this world be an entire purity, it is evident there will come a time of much greater purity in the church. Edwards also affirmed, and this is the critical point, that this time of a kind of ascendancy and dominance of the church and the gospel of Christ in the world would come 
through the use of means. Now, when I use the term means, what I mean by that and what he meant by that is that it will come by the ordinary efforts, labors of human beings working with the gifts and skills that they have at their disposal and yet doing so for purposes of serving Christ. This millennial period, this golden age would not come by some kind of external cataclysm some sort of great breaking in from outside. It will be the normal product of Christian people laboring using the means that are at their disposal. Things like prayer, things like missionary endeavor, training, funding, and sending human beings to go be involved in mission labors and related activities. One Edwardsian scholar wrote a book entitled The Eschatology of Jonathan Edwards. His name is Dr. Holdsworth. He says this, quote, Here, Jonathan Edwards stands as the link between the earlier Puritan missionary endeavors and the new Protestant world vision, which saw the beginning of the modern missionary movement in the person of William Carey. The whole earth was, quote, to be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And Edwards believed this biblical prophecy was near fulfillment. Edwards did believe that. He believed the Reformation, the Puritan movement, other things that were happening in the world in which he lived were the harbinger of the hoped-for beginning of this great time in which the gospel would just saturate the world. The reference here to William Carey is important. Many of you were in the class that I taught, and about a year ago at this time, we were looking at the modern missionary effort in a series on church history. Some of you recall that. The man who is commonly called the father of the modern missionary effort, who lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s, just shortly after Edwards died, was William Carey. William Carey was an Englishman. He was a cobbler. But somehow he had come to be fascinated with the prospect that the mission effort would take the gospel to the world and that vast populations of people here and there around the world would turn to Christ as a result of missionaries going and giving them the good news of Christ. But he was only a cobbler. He wasn't a scholar. He wasn't even a seminary graduate. By the time he died, he was viewed as one of the greatest linguists in the history of the world. But at this time, he was in his early 20s, just a man with this passion. He had on his shop wall, cobbled together, literally, little pieces of leather that became a world map that depicted the major population centers of the world. How many people live in China? How many people live in India? How many people live in Africa? And so on. And every time you walked in to get your shoes fixed, he would march you over to that map and show you all of this that filled his heart with anticipation. Finally, one day, he ginned up enough courage to go to his church. He was a part of the nonconformist movement there in England at the time. It was a Baptist church. And he went before the board of elders, old guys, you know, like some of us in this room, lots of gray hair, stodgy types, if you know what I mean. He stands up as this young upstart, and he gives them a speech. We need to be preparing, funding, and sending missionaries to take the gospel to the world. And he spoke with passion. When he was done, one of the older men sitting at the table said to him these words, young man, sit down. When God wants to convert the heathen, he can do so and he doesn't need any help from you or from me. That was kind of the attitude at the time. Now, I say this very cautiously. I hope you will not misunderstand it. It was a kind of distorted Calvinism that was in the minds of these Reformed Baptists there in England, and I have to say it wasn't just them. Calvin would never have endorsed, never have made such a statement, so don't blame him for this. But there was an idea that had basically kind of gotten into the thinking of these folks who came later saying God is sovereign, God can do what he wants, he can save whom he wants, when he wants, where he wants, and he can do it without our help. You might ask, well, what did they do about the Great Commission? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Their answer was, that's what Jesus said to the original apostles. He didn't say it to us. 
And so they did that job, but that's not incumbent upon us. Well, William Carey, I would say that was probably the moment that triggered his imagination and really put it all on steroids. And he sat down and for about four years went to work on a book which has come to be regarded as one of the most influential books in the history of the Christian movement called An Inquiry into the Obligation of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. Now, he was as Calvinistic as Calvin, believe me. But he also had read a lot of Edwards. And one of the interesting things about William Carey, which he frankly and repeatedly acknowledges, is that he fully embraced Edwards' vision of a coming day in which the gospel would cover the world, the knowledge of God would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He believed that. And he believed that that's what God was calling him and others to do. He was also impressed and touched by Edwards' other work, not the only other work, but another work of Edwards that was very influential, which was a biography of David Brainerd. David Brainerd, you may know, was a young man, a missionary to Native Americans here in the United States, died at the age of 29 of tuberculosis, had spent his life laboring, actually without much success until the very end, among native tribes here in America. He died in the home of Jonathan Edwards. He gave to Edwards his journals, and with Brainerd's permission, Edwards published those journals with commentary that became the biography of Brainerd, and that also became a powerful argument in favor of this effort to send missionaries to those who've never heard of Christ. Those were probably the single most influential, formative influences in the life of William Carey that put him on this track. You may know that William Carey is commonly called the father of the modern missionary effort. He went to India, spent his life there, became world-renowned. He translated the Bible into some 40 different languages and dialects in India. He was a, he was a genius in that regard. Following not long after him, David Livingston went to Africa. Not long after him, Hudson Taylor went to China. Hundreds and thousands followed in their wake. And the entire missionary idea that we take for granted today really began in the early 1800s as a result of William Carey being moved by the post-millennial eschatology of Jonathan Edwards. And so whatever you think of post-millennialism, at least give it credit that it had an incredible, almost incalculable impact on the history of the West, certainly, and eventually of the East as well. And so it was, uh, for that reason, I think, worth our time and attention to take a little look at it. I'll also mention this in passing. This Puritan idea, as we find it in Edwards and others, was also written deeply into the DNA of the early American self-image. And so a great deal of what we, as especially older Americans, hmm, remember, I don't think the younger folks actually even know this very well, but some of you who are more my vintage and older will know that part of the, part of the very heart of what it is to be distinctively American was a sort of deep spirit of optimism. When John Winthrop preached that sermon, A City on a Hill, he was preaching an eschatological sermon. America had been brought into being by the sovereign God in order to help open a chapter of a new day. And this is a city on a hill, which is going to be a beacon of light to the world. It was part of that scheme that the Puritans had developed, you see. And it was part of what they believed, and it got printed into the very heart of what it was to be American. We were the optimists in the world. We thought things were going to get better. We thought through good hard work and sort of that Puritan ethic of labor and so on and Yankee ingenuity, we could actually make things better. And part of that was a theological conviction, not just pragmatism, theology. And so Edwards and the Puritans with him had quite an impact at this particular moment in history. And so this eschatology, I think, is worth our consideration, if for no other reason than because it had that kind of effect. Well, what did Edwards say? He said there was going to be an extended period of dominance of the gospel. He, in this humble attempt, these are little snippet quotes here, expected what he called a future glorious advancement of the church. 
He based this partly on the book of Revelation, but also substantially on a fair number of Old Testament texts, Isaiah, Zechariah, and other texts he also used as part of his case for this particular vision. In Zechariah chapter 8, for example, he noted that it had never occurred in history to date that, quote, many people and strong nations ever came to seek the true God. It certainly never happened before the coming of Messiah, and he didn't believe that even since it had happened in the way that was really descriptive, uh, describing uh, the, the kind of description that we would find there in Zechariah and elsewhere. He said he'd never seen a time when the multitude of all nations, quote, taking hold of the skirts of the Jews. That's a term used in Zechariah 8. Of course, Edwards believed that the true Jews in the world, the true seed of Abraham, were those who had faith in Christ, as the New Testament itself says. And so he had no problem seeing that as describing what might take place in Christian history. He saw in the prophecy of Zechariah, quote, the Spirit of God has doubtless respect to things far greater than the return of more captives from Chaldea, which is the way some people had viewed the fulfillment of those prophecies in the Old Testament. He believed a time would come when every nation would embrace the Christian faith, not every single solitary person in those nations, he wasn't teaching that, but that Basically, every nation in the world would be dominated by and really uh, committed to generally a Christian outlook, and there'd be many Christian believers in each one of them. He said, quote, a time will come when, quote, there will not be one nation remaining in the world which shall not embrace the true religion. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 12, no doubt demonstrates that the nation and kingdom that will not serve God will perish. Heathen idolatry will be destroyed, as appears in Jeremiah 10, 11, quote, while this earth and these heavens remain. Part of what Edwards is saying is it takes place in the normal progress of history. No cataclysms from outside. This is God working through his people in history to accomplish these great objectives. He said, interestingly, and put quite a bit of emphasis on this, that this time of a sort of widespread recognition of the gospel would especially include Jewish people. He said, quote, nothing is more certainly told, referring to Romans chapter 11, than the national conversion of the Jews. With respect to the time since Christ, their preservation as a distinct nation has been remarkable. That is rather a remarkable thing, whether you're a Christian believer or not. I think any person casually familiar with history has to be impressed that we continue to have a distinct Jewish people in the world to this day. Uh, Dr. John Sonneland, who many of you, of course, have known over the years, uh, gave me a cassette tape. That's how long ago this was, probably 20 years ago. And he, uh, the title of this tape was Ever Met a Hittite? And the speaker on the tape, I don't remember who it was, but it was, it was very uh, touching and rather humorous at the time, talked about all of these ancient Semitic groups, or ancient groups really, most of them Semitic, that people took for granted. The Moabites, the Ammonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, you know, all of these various groups. And he said, and he asked the question, you know, when was the last time you shook hands with a Hittite? You ever had an Amorite wait on you at a restaurant? But he said, every one of us has had dealings with an Israelite. Somehow or other, of all the ancient people groups, they just keep hanging on. Edward's view was that God and his providence has in fact, in spite of the persecutions, the pogroms, all of the abuse and unspeakable mistreatment. Of course, Edwards didn't even know about the 20th century, but he'd seen enough already to say the only reason these people have survived such horrific abuse in history is because God and his sovereignty has preserved them just so someday they, as a tribute to Christ, would also come in and recognize him as King Jesus. And so Edwards really argues that with a certain degree of potency. He says that at the moment, however, before this time arrives, we are in a period of tribulation. He says, quote, as the calamity brought on the Jewish nation by Rome continues all this time, so is the Christian church throughout this time kept in a state of tribulation and oppression. 
He said that is not ended till the reign of Antichrist is ended. He believed that the church had been taken over by malevolent forces. We've already talked about that, that they were burning people at the stakes. They were engaging in all kinds of horrific abuses and so on. Thousands upon thousands of people were, putting, were being put to death in the name of Christ, you see, and Edwards thought all of that spells a tribulation, a time of tribulation for the church, and he believed that that was going to continue, really, until such time as God now just opened the doors for the potency of the gospel to be realized, and he was hoping, of course, that he was very close to that time. He believed that there'd be a culminating conflict right before this era began. He said, quote, prior to the dawning of this great age, the kings of the earth and the whole world are represented as gathered together. This is Revelation 16, and it's the context where there's mention of the Battle of Armageddon. So that's where Edwards would put this. He says, then the seventh angel pours out his vial and the kingdom of Satan is overthrown. He says, Christ rides forth, the rider on the white horse of double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, you see, that's the word of God and the potency of God's word, living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Christ rides forth to the same great battle as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Revelation 19. Satan, he says, is shut up in hell at least for a season. In this battle, Christ and his church shall obtain a complete and entire victory over their enemies by his word and spirit. This victory is not accomplished with bazookas, with bombs, with hand grenades, with other armaments. This is a much more powerful and much more potent weaponry wielded by King Jesus. It is the power of his word and the power of his spirit. The seventh trumpet, he continues, shall sound, and the seventh vial shall be poured out, and Satan's visible kingdom upon earth shall be destroyed. Heresies, he says, infidelity, superstition shall be abolished. The kingdom of Antichrist and of Islam shall be overthrown. The veil that blinds the eyes of the Jews will be withdrawn. Heathenism will be destroyed, and all the ends of the earth shall look to Christ and be saved. The devil shall be shut up in hell. There will be a great spiritual resurrection of the church, which is the resurrection alluded to in chapter 20, according to Edwards, and judgments upon all of God's enemies. He finally concludes this little section. Now the church shall forget her sorrow. See what joyful praises are sung to God on this occasion by the universal church in heaven and earth in the beginning of the 19th chapter of Revelation. So Edward sees a time of upheaval issuing forth into this wonderful and protracted time of peace under the influences of the gospel worldwide. And if you can believe this, he actually thought that in this era there would be a united church throughout the world. And all of the bickering, all of the divisions over so many picayune matters are going to be set aside. He said there would be broad agreement on these great matters of Christian teaching. Quote, it will be a time of great light and knowledge, of the unraveling of the difficulties in the doctrines of religion, making the crooked straight, the rough plain, and the darkness light before God's people. Interestingly, he believed that a great deal of the leadership of the church in this era would come from what we would call third world sources. He said, quote, it may be hoped that then many Negroes and Indians will be divines and that excellent books will be published in Africa. Now, you may think that's kind of ho-hum, but this man was writing these words in 1740. You would look long and hard to find anybody, anybody, even among the Puritans, who had such an outlook. He was so far ahead of his time it's the kind of thing that got Perry Miller thinking about these whole, this whole Puritan atmosphere and how we may have missed some important things about them. One man who is a contemporary, who is actually thoroughly committed, he embraces Jonathan Edwards thoroughly. His name is David Smith. He worked for six years as a tutor at Samuel Bill Theological College in Nigeria. Nigeria. 
And he wrote a book about his experience and also sort of correlated it with his Edwardsian outlook. And he said this, quote, as we are delivered from a one-way street mentality in relation to mission, we will recognize that in the future churches of the third world, in the future, churches of the third world will play a major role, perhaps the major role in evangelization. Jonathan Edwards' amazing prophecy is even now being fulfilled before our eyes. It reminds me of being at a session meeting some months back, maybe a couple of years ago, when we had a, a wonderful African uh, pastor leader here at, at a session meeting just talking to us briefly. John Sowers invited him to come. I don't think uh, any of us were ready for the power and the force of the 15-minute presentation that this man named Warku made. He was in tears as he talked to us, and we were in tears as we heard him speak. He was thanking us that years ago we sent missionaries to Africa. I was sitting there feeling sheepish because I remember going to summer camp year after year as a kid and saying, no way I'm going to Africa. No way, you know. And now I have this black African man thanking me. And it cut me to the core just to be in that conversation. I'd love to see a few of those African divines come to America as evangelists. We need them. Amen? And uh, so anyway, this is what uh, this particular individual was uh, remarking. He said, interestingly, Edwards did, that the organization of this worldwide church would very likely be Presbyterian. You dig that action? That's even more interesting because, of course, he was a congregational pastor. All of his years, he worked in congregational churches. So this is not exactly to be expected. But nevertheless, he always, in his heart, was probably more Presbyterian than congregational. It was just the state of things in colonial America at the time. But he says this, quote, as to my understanding, or I'm, as to my subscribing to the influence of the Westminster Confession, there would be no difficulty. And as to the Presbyterian government, I have long been perfectly out of conceit of our unsettled, independent, and confused way of church government in this land, referring to congregationalism, his own church. And he said, and the Presbyterian way has ever appeared to me the most agreeable to the word of God and reason and the nature of things. He believed that this time would be a time of great human achievement and prosperity. He believed that as the dominant influence of the gospel reached communities, and if I can just put it in this, these terms, and people didn't have to lock their doors so much anymore, didn't have to spend so much money just engaged in protection against criminal activity because the whole zeitgeist of the time ri rises to a different level. You know, some of us have had that experience even in our lives, that we just lived in a community where it didn't occur to us that we were constantly on the lookout for bad behavior, destructive, hard. We just didn't expect it. It just was not part of the culture. And Edwards really believes that as that particular influence reaches the world through the presence of the gospel, it would free the human imagination to much greater achievements than we've ever seen before. He said, the general spiritual state will have a tendency to health and long life, Zechariah chapter 8, and temporal prosperity will such, be such that the days of Solomon will be seen to be but an image of those days. There's an interesting text which he also mentioned in, in Isaiah chapter 65, that a time would come in history when somebody that died at 100 years old would be regarding as having died in their youth. You see this idea that there would be under the great progress in medical care and in all of the kinds of things we can accomplish when we're just not encumbered by always having to protect ourselves so much, what was the limit to the things that might be achieved? And so he makes quite a point out of that. Another Edwardsian scholar by the name of Lorraine Bettner, some of you know his name, commenting on this part of Edwards' thought, says the following, but no matter how marvelous this material prosperity may become, it will ever remain but the byproduct of the moral and spiritual prosperity that already to some extent characterizes the partially Christianized nations. It is abundantly clear that these blessings do not originate under pagan religions. What marvels must lie ahead when nations the world over are Christian when the millennium becomes a reality. So there's still some folks running around loose who think this is uh, 
a correct appraisal of what God is doing in history. And whatever you may think of it, I'm just leaving that to your own judgment, but certainly it does have a wonderfully kind of inspiring influence, I think, for all of us to think that there may be something like that that God is doing. He believes that at the end of this period there would be a time of great apostasy. The 20th chapter of Revelation speaks of Satan being loosed for a brief time at the end. Satan would be loosed from the prison for a little while, it reads. He'll go forth, it says, to deceive the nations, that a vast army would gather. Edward says this intimates that the apostasy would be very general. So there's going to be kind of a, a last great hurrah, you might say, for the forces of evil in the world before the end of this uh, time of history, but finally they will be defeated. Christ himself returns. Edward certainly believed in the second advent of Christ, but believed it would happen after this period. Hence, this is sometimes called post-millennialism. This that I've been describing, if I could just put it in, as I'm concluding here, some sort of brief statements, is what I'd like to call the Puritan effect. There was a kind of psychology to Puritanism. I'm leaving it to your judgment whether you think theologically they are accurate or not at this point. I'm just kind of reporting it to you. But there certainly was a historical effect to the way in which the Puritans saw things. There was an irrepressibly strong sense of optimism for a bright future. They believed it was God's work in history. They believed that as God was at work, that this was going to be kind of the end result, the end blessing that would come as a result. Augustine had a very similar idea. He didn't have this sort of millennial era, era at the end, but he certainly believed in a kind of progress of the gospel in history, which is why people went out as missionaries under his influence uh, earlier in the church's history. So this idea that Christian people are looking forward, contributing, sometimes dying for their faith in the hope of what God is going to do in history was part of that Puritan effect. Secondly, as we were noting earlier, the Puritans were committed to the idea that God would accomplish these things using means, human means. We don't just sit back in a kind of passive way and wait for God to act. He acts through us. We are his instruments. We are the tools. He gives us gifts. He gives us minds. He gives us technology. He gives us insight. He gives us science. He gives us all of these things that are part of the legitimate concern that we have, clear back from the Garden of Eden, to do that which is going to facilitate this sort of progress. And finally, he believed, a, or the Puritans believed that a deep byproduct of this deep, significant labor using human means toward a brighter future engenders in each of us a deep sense of personal well-being and satisfaction. We commonly call it the satisfaction of a job well done. Well, take that and just escalate it by a hundredfold and you begin to get a sense of what the Puritans were about. This is the Puritan work ethic. This is the ethics of labor that was so dominantly a part of the Puritan outlook that it caused Max Weber, who was no Christian, to write a book by that title. Now, some people criticize Weber, but he was still on to something there. That there was something distinctively, uniquely part of the cultus of this Reformation Puritan attitude that just created this more or less irrepressible belief that we can do better things with God's help in history. All right, that's the Puritan effect. So anyway, the Puritan effect now, I want to say to you, goes in two different tracks. This spirit of optimism. So there is what I'm going to call a kind of Christian optimism, a Christian expression, which, ex which found its, uh, uh, kind of, uh, was demonstrated through, as we were saying earlier, the modern missionary effort. Certainly the notion of what was traditionally called the Christian America with this kind of optimistic outlook, a city on a hill. That was part of it. Another thing happened, and that was that this spirit of optimism also began to show up in a secular expression. Now I'm just setting you up for our conversation next week, all right? So this is just a little bit of preliminary, kind of a teaser, a little trailer for what I want to talk about next week. Because not only was there this Christian expression of optimism, but in a sense, the same spirit of optimism filtered through the age of reason, 
through the Industrial Revolution, through the Scientific Revolution, through these, which were really in many ways a product of the Reformation, into a more secular expression, especially in the 19th century. So if you're familiar with the major thinkers of the 19th century, you'll agree that by far most of them were irrepressibly optimistic. But their optimism was not rooted in a biblical faith. Their optimism was rooted rather, oddly enough, in a sort of sub-rational power at work. The catch term in the 19th century, the most popular word I would say that anybody ever used was the word evolution. Hegel was an evolutionist, you see. I, I don't mean biological evolution, I mean kind of a metaphysical evolution, a dialectical idealism. Karl Marx, who creates the Marxist vision, it's an optimistic view that things are moving toward a kind of utopian vision. Comte, the father of scientism and positivism, had this kind of optimistic view. Darwin put these into biological categories. Feuerbach, of course, believed in the uh, the unlimited spirit of the human heart. And I'm not mentioning others, Herbert Spencer, uh, Feuerbach, so many others. The whole kind of feel of the 19th century was that we are on this great wave moving in a good direction, an optimistic direction. I believe they got it from the Christian movement, but unfortunately they cut the foundation out from under and just stayed with the kind of good feelings that things are getting better. And so the 19th century had this very optimistic view but it was secularized. It didn't really hit the reefs until the early 20th century. And of course, you know the First World War did deal a body blow to 19th century liberal optimism. But even then, people were still convinced, well, this war that we just experienced was what? The war to end all wars. We're still optimistic. We were so convinced it was the last war, we called it what? The Great War. And then what happened? And the Second World War made the First World War look like a pop gun affair by comparison. That's when the spirit of optimism died. Died and we got existentialism, we got irrationalism, we got all of the aftermath of a despairing culture in Europe especially, which was devastated, of course, but also to some degree in America. But in the 19th century, everything was sweetness and light. Everything was getting better. That caused, I leave you with this, that caused what we, we would probably call conservative or evangelical Christians in the context of this secularized optimism to begin to be very skeptical of optimism itself. And it produced yet another vision of the book of Revelation, decidedly pessimistic. This time in which we live, in which we see secular, fundamentally atheistic people arguing for optimism means that the real Christian truth must be pessimistic. That things must be going from bad to worse. That life is going downhill, not uphill. And the Puritan vision of a hopeful future was replaced by a vision of a future that was devolving into chaos from which Christ must certainly come sometime soon and rescue us. And there was an explosion of eschatologies in the early 1800s, including Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Dispensationalism, Seventh-day Adventism, and others that took that view. They all shared a common view of eschatology, though they went many different directions on other points of theology. That's what I want to get to next week. I want to start talking about the early 1800s and how a vision of Revelation was shifted deeply by what was taking place in the broader culture. Thank you, you've been very patient. I'm done. Um, thoughts, comments? Thank you.